indeed. Hello, world. Welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. This program has been in the making for the last four years now, as it hibernated in the deep crevices of my mind. Just a few weeks ago, it all just seemed to come together, and suddenly, Sashi Singh's Talking Point took shape. Sashi Singh's Talking Point is an initiative to encourage dialogue in how we, as a global community, can talk about issues that affect our everyday lives. Through sharing of concerns, ideas, issues that should be exposed and discussed in an open, candid, and transparent manner, can we raise awareness in our communities. I hope you can join me in this journey to communicate effectively through this medium and speak your mind on things that matter to you. As a caveat, let me state right at the very outset that religious intolerance and profanity will not be tolerated or accepted on this platform. So what can you expect from the program? If you are interested in politics, current affairs, and news, then you will find lots of that in this show. SSTP will take an in-depth look at developments in Fiji, Australia, and from around the world. I will be joined in the program by our two regular contributors, Dennis Rounds from Lautoka, Fiji, and Nikhil Singh from Sydney. Their introductions a little bit later. It has been said that exclusive things are always launched. To launch the first episode of SSTP, it is my great privilege and honor to welcome to the inaugural program our chief guest this afternoon, Mr. Graham Everett Leong. But before I bring him on screen, let me tell you about this esteemed guest of ours. Graham Leong is one of Fiji's most senior lawyers, a former diplomat and public servant. Graham was born in Levuka and attended Natambua High School in Lautoka before studying at the University of the South Pacific. Under an Australian government scholarship, he successfully completed his Bachelor of Laws degree with honours at the University of Adelaide. He spent the best part of more than 15 years in the service of the government of Fiji, both in the Crown Law Office, as it was known before 1987, and also in the office of the DPP. Graham Leong was a Fulbright Scholar when he completed his Master of Laws degree at UCLA. Graham has served as Fiji's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, based in New York. He later entered private practice, where he was managing partner of the Suva law firm Howard's, but chose not to renew his practicing certificate following the 2006 military coup. He is past president of the Fiji Law Society and chairman of the Electoral Commission. He then embarked on an international legal career, working in Geneva, Kenya, Solomon Islands, and Nauru. Graham was appointed Nauru's first ambassador to the International Seabed Authority. Following the end of his contract in Nauru, where he was also Secretary for Justice, he returned to Fiji at the end of 2019. He is currently a legal consultant in Suva. Graham is a strong advocate of human rights and rule of law, and with that impressive background, it is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Graham Everett Leong. Good afternoon, Graham, and welcome to the inaugural Sashi Singh Talking Point. Good afternoon, Sashi, and good afternoon, viewers. And thank you, Sashi, for inviting me to this program. It's a great privilege to join you today. The honor, the honor is all mine, Graham. Uh, when I mooted this program, uh, you were the first guest that I thought of, and I'm so delighted that you accepted my invitation. Welcome once again. Thank you, Sashi. Right, uh, Graham, let's get straight to... Uh, our talk for today. In early October 2021, together with uh, the former Se Secretary General of Fiji's Parliament, Ms. Mary Chapman, you co-authored an article 
which was titled, Is Fiji Still a Democracy? The article started off by saying that democracy takes different forms, but all draw on the principle of government of the people, by the people, for the people. The people, you said, are at the center. They elect the government through their votes and have the right to peacefully change it by the same method. Every democratic government, you said, you wrote, has a lengthy list of these. Graham, in today's Fiji, let me ask you first up, do people really have the freedom and rights as enshrined in the Constitution? Thank you, Sashi. We have, uh, on paper at any rate, a Bill of Rights that uh, seems to grant people all kinds of rights, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and so on. But I, I think, um, to be sure, the reality is somewhat different. It's very difficult, for example, to get permits if you want to protest or engage in a demonstration. It's uh, very difficult for the media, I believe, to publish uh, freely. Uh, there is a lot of self-censorship of the media. Um, so uh, I can't recall when the last trade union strike uh, took place in this country. We've had the same government for the last 14 years. And in recent memory, uh, there have been no trade union strikes uh, which uh, is, to put it mildly, very unusual. So when you talk about democracy um, in its fullest version, uh, a lot of the rights that um, are supposedly in the Constitution have been severely restricted and um, circumscribed. Uh, there is, I believe, a widespread fear in this country today of criticizing government, um, of criticizing government ministers. And in a healthy, robust democracy, which you have, for example, in Australia, it, it's uh, quite different. You will know, Sashi, that um, Scott Morrison um, and the other members of the federal cabinet are routinely criticized. Um, yes. And they're not, uh, the critics of the government are not hauled into the police station or visited by the police in the middle of the night for expressing dissenting opinions. Uh, but I think uh, in Fiji, um, it's quite different. So um, I would suggest respectfully that um, we seem to pay lip service to democracy, but the reality on the ground is somewhat different. You mentioned a key word there of self-censorship, and uh, from what you've just delivered, uh, it makes sense as to why self-censorship has taken center stage. Now, for all intent and purpose, it has generally been observed that uh, Fiji is being run by Vorengi Mbani Marama, and his closest colleague, Ayaz Sayed Kayum, who have always maintained that their constitution is democratic. They have said that their constitution gave Fiji true democracy for the first time. What are your views on such a proclamation? Firstly, from where Fiji and its people stand today, and if I may add two questions together. Secondly, if we look at democracy and Fiji, pre the coup era starting in 1987? I think obviously, Sashi, um, the Attorney General and the Prime Minister and I have very different views of democracy. Um, I don't think it's democratic, for example, under this constitution, which has been widely applauded in some quarters at any rate, that you, you can have, for example, somebody being elected to parliament with 400 votes and sitting as a cabinet minister. And in the opposition benches, you will find people who have received uh, 
close to 2,000 votes and uh, have not won a seat in parliament. Uh, there's hardly anything democratic about that. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the fundamental rights that are contained in the Constitution are very severely restricted in reality. The other aspect uh, I would comment on, Sashi, is um, that the whole of Fiji is one constituency. When you think about the complexity of Fiji's geography and the 300 plus islands, uh, the notion or idea of local representation in parliament uh, has disappeared. Who, for example, do the 51 members of parliament represent? They represent the entire population of Fiji. Um, and it's not what it used to be. As you know, Sashi, uh, having lived in Fiji and experienced past elections, uh, we had localized constituencies. For example, um, in the Western Division, you would have had Western General Communal seat. And um, that was a, a communal system of voting. But you knew exactly who your local MP was. And um, that was an important aspect of democracy, which is no longer the case today. So it's a very different kind of democracy that has been rolled out to the public of Fiji. And I, for one, do not accept the proposition that today Fiji is more democratic uh, than it used to be. I'll come back to local representations further down uh, uh, the program. Now, I have found your article very, very interesting. And uh, it made a specific mention of Section 131, Subsection 2 of the Constitution, which gives the Republic of Fiji Military Forces overall responsibility to ensure at all times the security, defense, and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians. Can you please briefly define what is meant by well-being? Well, Sashi, well-being is an ordinary expression in English, and constitutions um, are typically interpreted uh, literally. But the well-being of a country is generally how people uh, are feeling, uh, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of uh, living well, and a feeling of living happily. And this uh, provision in the Constitution, Sashi, has never been interpreted judicially, but it's a very wide expression. And I think uh, it's an unfortunate inclusion in the Constitution because it could be used by the military as a pretext for second guessing the political judgments and decisions of the elected government of the day. So um, in that respect, I think it uh, is anti-democratic in its uh, intentions. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what interpretation the current military and military head would place upon this provision. But I'm not comfortable as a Democrat with that constitutional provision which you've pointed out. Still staying with that well-being concept, well-being of all Fijians, my question is, is this really the role of the Republic of the Fiji military forces or should this be the role of an elected government, a government by the people, a government of the people, by the people and for the people? Does the army really have a role in a democratic government? I think, Sasi, you know the answer to that. In a democracy, the army or the military is subservient to the elected government of the day. The army takes its orders from civilians. The civilian members of parliament, in particular the, the ministers of the cabinet or the minister responsible for defense, uh, he or she would, in a democracy, uh, direct orders to the military and the military would be obliged, would be required to accept the directions of the government. But as I mentioned earlier, um, this part of the constitution, 
seems to uh, be the antithesis or runs against accepted universal norms of democracy. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest uh, this afternoon is renowned Fiji lawyer Graham Everett Leong. Graham, you and Mary Chapman also discussed what you termed local democracy. Um, you've touched on it briefly. Can you please explain what this term means? In the past, we in Fiji had uh, local government elections. It is the Nandi Town Council, the Latoka City Council, the Suva City Council, and all of these um, local councils or municipalities had um, elections. And, and typically, um, all the local government elections uh, comprised of wards. We called them wards in the old days. And um, so that was local government. And, and local governments were responsible for everything from parking meters to the clearance of uh, rubbish bins to street lighting uh, to, to the, the collection of rates. Uh, the amusement parks and gardens uh, for local citizens or ratepayers. Um, but since uh, I think 2009 or after the military coup of 2006, Sasi? It was uh, 2006, Fiji is, I think. Yes, I think we have not had local government elections. And, and right. so that very important uh, local democracy at the local level, the democracy which touches people's everyday lives, that's been gone or absent for more than a decade. And, and so the people are left without representation um, at that level, which I think is regrettable because our local governments generally worked very, very well. You would know this, Sassi, because um, I believe your father, your late father, was the mayor of uh, Lotoka City at one stage and uh, equipped himself with great distinction. But as I said, um, unfortunately, we don't have local government elections anymore. And um, town and city council, councils in Fiji are run by administrators. Yes, indeed. Uh, in those days, you mentioned my late father. They used to um, uh, fight the election campaigns in a very robust manner. They used to have uh, a very robust debates uh, in the council chambers. And... Uh, everything all good well for the local community because the debates they had was for the benefit of, of the city or the town that uh, they uh, were councillors for. And that has indeed changed. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the um, idea of adequate representation currently at a local level to me doesn't exist. And I'm sure you, you'll agree with that. Yes, it doesn't uh, exist, Sassi. I, I, do, I do remember a time when if a ratepayer wanted to sit in and listen to uh, council debates uh, in a town or city council, uh, you could freely do so. But now they're with administrators. Who do you turn to? The administrator is typically appointed by the government and is responsible to the government of the day, the political government of the day. So there is a complete lack of transparency and ratepayers have no one to turn to uh, like they did in the past, which I think um, is a retrograde step and doesn't serve the community at all. Now, if you could look into your crystal ball, why do you think locally elected councils were terminated uh, in favor of, uh, as you termed, government appointed administrators well i sassy i don't think um that's a difficult question to answer they, it's obvious that um the people running the show uh were not comfortable or are not comfortable holding local government elections i i think if the elections were held tomorrow at the local government level the uh fiji first party would be surprised um, at the level of rejection of, of their candidates. Uh, so they don't want to face the humiliation of uh, running local government elections. There can't possibly be any other reason 
other than that. Now, you mentioned uh, in the past we used to have constituencies, uh, communal seats, general seats, etc. And uh, a short while ago, you mentioned that uh, now it's, it's the nation itself is one constituency. And in today's uh, electoral system that they have in Fiji, the Dihon system, um, is there any local democratic representation by the members of parliament who are elected? There isn't, Sasi. The notion of uh, local representation doesn't exist. Um, and you've got this um, bizarre, I can call it a bizarre system, where the whole of the country is one constituency. And that means all 51 members of parliament literally represent the whole country. So everyone from the top of Undu Point in Maduata to the bottom of Onailao, or to Southern Kandavu. Um, how do people sitting in Suva represent all these people? Uh, they have obviously different needs for different parts of the country. So the concept of localized representation um, has dissolved. It no longer exists. Um, and I don't think it's a satisfactory system at all for, for Fiji in terms of uh, the needs of the people. Indeed, uh, a sad uh, indictment on uh, the, the populace. Now, I'd like to shift our attention to the floor of Fiji's parliament. Your article stated that uh, the story of democracy is one of decline in parliament. Please explain what you meant by that. I think um, what I meant was when I wrote this article with Mary Chapman, a lot of the um, bills that are debated in parliament today are very quickly introduced. There's very little time for debate and the debating time is restrictive and restricted and laws are passed very quickly. I do recall in the past when the Law Reform Commission was active, quite often the government of the day had the bills published and they were widely circulated among stakeholders in the community. So ordinary citizens, uh, professional groupings, such as accountants, lawyers, doctors, uh, engineers, uh, and others, uh, bankers, uh, could freely contribute to uh, the, the drafting or the uh, refinement of laws. So by the time the bills were tabled in the House of Parliament, uh, it had gone through a process of widespread consultation amongst interested parties. And that really made a lot of sense because when the legislation was eventually passed, it had gone through various filters and uh, various layers of consultation. And the end result was that the law uh, reflected better the will of the people. It reflected better the needs of different constituencies and different constituents. I think that aspect of consultation um, is now sadly lacking in the lawmaking process. Now you've uh, quite rightly stated that the government has uh, used its majority in parliament to change the standing orders. And uh, this is startling. Since 2014, the standing orders have been changed at least five times. Your article gave an example of Standing Order 51, for instance, which deals with motions for bills to proceed without delay. You said it was being abused. What, what do you mean by that? I think, uh, Sasi, what we meant by that was Standing Order 51 was meant for urgent bills, uh, bills that needed to be passed um, quickly in a state of emergency. Um, but now it seems that every bill is uh, passed using Standing Order 51. So that denies Parliament, it denies the opposition, the opportunity to, to widely canvass the pros and cons behind legislation, to talk to the uh, members of the public, to get their feedback and views and responses on various aspects of the laws that are being debated. 
and um, it's not unusual for laws to be passed uh, within 48 hours of being first tabled. And, and so that's what I, we meant by um, legislation by stealth. Uh, you can wake up uh, in the middle of the night and then next morning there's a new Companies Act um, with a whole raft of changes uh, that no one has ever seen before in the legal profession. Uh, and you know, these are quite dramatic changes requiring um, major shifts in the way business is conducted. Um, and I don't think that's the way lawmaking should proceed. Lawmaking, Sashi, should, uh, in my view, be as transparent as possible. Uh, it should be as consultative as possible. Um, and if you do that, the end product is likely to be better, is likely to work more effectively. Well said indeed. Uh, you're watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point with our chief guest this afternoon, very renowned uh, Fiji lawyer, Mr. Graham Everett Leong. Now, Graham, in previous parliaments, not less than 30 odd days were given to MPs to study bills to ensure that they, as well as members of the public, were given enough time to research and study the bills and to seek the views of uh, people in their own constituency before parliamentary debates began. Now, to me, this was parliament in those days acting at its best. In recent times, uh, as you've said, uh, there seems to be a high sense of expediency in passing bills by the current government, um, sometimes, well, most times without a thorough debate or scrutiny or discussion. Now, why do you think this is happening in parliament now? Can you give examples? Yeah, I think, Sashi, it's, it's because the government has obviously got a legislative agenda. It wants to be seen to be uh, promoting that agenda. It, it's in a hurry to show the public and the electorate that it's getting things done. But quite often, I think in practice, uh, what is not happening is that because laws are being passed so quickly, um, people can't keep up with the pace of change. Um, and uh, it's making the conduct of business that much more difficult. You know, you've got a new Trademarks Act. Uh, you've got a new Climate Change Act. I think the Climate Change Act is uh, something like 80 pages. Uh, and if the lawyers themselves, because most of these laws are, are drafted by lawyers and read and interpreted by lawyers and judges, if the lawyers have difficulty reading and understanding the laws, how much more difficult will it be for lay people such as yourselves um, or others who are not lawyers? And, um, you know, lawyers aren't exactly uh, known for writing simple English. And so my point is that if you're going to be writing laws that you expect people to obey as a first Surely um, the laws must be written in simple English. They should have gone through a process of consultation so that people understand what exactly is being um, legislated in their parliament. Uh, unfortunately, uh, very little of that is being done. And hence, uh, you mention lawmaking by stealth in the cover of darkness. You get new laws just being passed. Yeah, that, that's what I meant, Sashi, that laws are being passed so quickly. And um, before you've had a chance to bat an eyelid, you've got a bill tabled in Parliament. And then, lo and behold, 48 hours later, that bill has become law. And I would be very surprised, for example, using the Climate Change Act um, as a point of reference, whether any member of Parliament has read that 80-page document from the first page to the last. Uh, it's very complex, it's very technical, um, and if parliamentarians haven't read it, I don't think you can expect members of the public to have uh, done so as well. So legislation by stealth is uh, just a shorthand way of saying that things are being done hastily, um, things are being done too quickly, um, the pace of lawmaking uh, should slow down uh, to a pace where ordinary people are able to follow what's going on. Graham, let me take you back uh, to the days of uh, Ratu Sir Kamisese Mara, 
uh, Mr. A.D. Patel, Mr. S.M. Koya, etc. These and uh, others during their time in Parliament were regarded and respected as uh, true statesmen, regardless of the political affiliation they had. Now, you've stated that uh, dignity that Parliament was once known for has all but disappeared. What are the reasons behind the moral decay in Fiji's Parliament today? I think um, there's a new generation which doesn't understand basic courtesy, the importance of good manners, the importance of civility. I remember the old days, which wasn't so long ago. Uh, Ratumara and Ms. Koy would have disagreements but uh, in Parliament, and these were entirely professional disagreements, but later they would happily um, share a cup of tea or a meal together. And when um, A.D. Patel died, the late A.D. Patel, I believe the late Ratusa Edward Dakambao was asked to speak at his funeral. Um, so there was a, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of statesmanship, and just uh, good manners uh, that we don't really see today. And in today's parliament, uh, there's a lot of hectoring uh, there's invective, and it's quite a toxic uh, situation where there's name calling, and we've even seen misogyny as well. People get criticized for the way they dress. I, I think a minister, uh, one of the current ministers, described uh, an opposition MP dress uh, as if she had a flea market. So that that's the sort of um, situation that we have today. It's become very petty very charged and very personal, and it's not a pleasant environment uh, at all. I can well imagine so. Now, an important aspect of any democracy uh, is the consultative uh, process between the government and its people. It seems that the concept of uh, consultation in Fiji's parliamentary circle is a thing of the past. Now, may I please request, uh, if you can, give us examples of the consultation process and how it has declined, particularly uh, with a view of uh, some of the bills that have been enacted uh, in recent times. They do have parliamentary um, committees that uh, sometimes uh, sit and solicit views from the public, to be fair. Um, I'm not sure how many people attend these consultations. But um, I don't think the consultations are as extensive or as widespread as they used to be, uh, Sashi. Um, it's not a really consultative process. Basically, the government um, does what it wants to do. It... All right. Now, uh, I found something absolutely astonishing. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it, is it really true that uh, Bill Number 17, the Electoral Registration of Voters Amendment Bill, was passed after a debate of just one hour? Um, I think from memory that that could be the case. I'm not, um, I don't have a specific recollection of that particular debate, but um, if you tell me that's the position, um, I would accept that, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, I stand, and I that's stand what to I be mean, corrected. Right? Yeah, I stand to be that, corrected, but uh, I think I have that uh, on good authority. Now, Graham, um, turning to uh, one of the aspects of democracy is freedom of expression. And uh, first of all, one of the fundamentals, as I said, is freedom of expression, freedom of speech. I started off uh, right at the beginning asking you whether democracy exists. question now is, does Fiji really have freedom of speech and freedom of uh, expression as enshrined in the Constitution? Well, um, yes and no. Let me answer that question this way. For example, we had this uh, situation earlier in the year. I think it was in the month of August or September. A controversial piece of legislation known as Bill 17 uh, was introduced into Parliament. And um, to cut a long story short, Bill 17 uh, sought to make amendments 
to the Itoke Land Trust Act so that approvals of the um, TLTB for certain land transactions wasn't needed. Um, and a couple of uh, senior MPs um, and former MPs, including Mr. Chowdhury, Niko Nawaikula, uh, Litienge Nibaravi, Felipe Tuisawao, they had uh, reservations about the bill and the way it was being quickly introduced. Um, and then within a couple of days, they were called to the police station and made to answer questions about their views. Um, and that's what I meant by limitations on free speech. So free speech is not entirely free. Um, and uh, there was a case, uh, I believe, of, of a medical doctor from Lotoka, Dr. Chone Hawea. Hawea, yes. He had uh, expressed very strong views against the government's um, anti-COVID vaccination policy. And um, the doctor told me himself that uh, I think it was 10 o'clock one evening in September, about eight or nine policemen surrounded his house in Lotoka, and he was driven to Suva in the middle of the night um, and asked to answer questions at the CID office in Suva. Uh, what was his crime? His crime was expressing a view which the government of the day was not comfortable hearing. And to this day, he has not been charged with a criminal offense. I mean, why take the man 100 kilometers from Lotoka to be interviewed at Totongo in the CID office? Or because um, the views he expressed were not orthodox. He obviously offended somebody in the Ministry of Health and um, driving him across Vitilevu in the middle of the night would have been a very worrying and troubling experience for anyone. You know, they could have had a road accident at night, they could have driven into a horse at Singotoka somewhere, uh, but the poor man was terrified. Uh, and I know this because I met him at the police station um, two days or a day after he arrived into Suva. So these kinds of incidents have a chilling effect on free speech. If you're watching um, MPs themselves being taken to the police station or even professionals like doctors, uh, that's not going to lend confidence to the rank and file in the population. If you're a carpenter or if you uh, are a bank officer wishing to express an opinion, you look at this um, state of affairs, you, you must be thinking, oh my God, if they can take a former prime minister in, what chance do I have in a police station? So yes, I, I do believe free speech um, is is limited in this country in a way that is anti-democratic. And the incredible thing is, um, in in the case of Dr. Hawe, he could have been interviewed uh, for whatever reason at the Lautoka police station. Exactly. And that, and you, that you know. too, pardon me, and that too, during a COVID lockdown, the, the good doctor is taken from Lautoka and is transported yes. all the way to Suva. Now, yes. they, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know the, the, the police station in Lotoka Sashi is behind, uh, beside my old school, Natambo. Yes. And uh, every police station in Fiji has a CID office. And when I met Dr. Hawe in Suva, he um, was quite concerned that uh, by transporting across to Suva, they may have breached uh, COVID protocols because he would have been in close proximity in the car that was taking him to Suva with policemen that were escorting him. So he was very upset also about that. Um, and why interview him in another town um, 100 kilometers away? Why couldn't they have waited till the morning to interview him? Why in sense. the middle of the night should he be taken to the town? Uh, so it was all part of the process of intimidating people, of putting them in their place. Uh, and if you're watching the, the strain of events, it's not going to encourage you to speak up. On the contrary, you, you probably would hide your views uh, and keep them to yourselves. Now, speaking about... Uh 
freedom of expression, etc. Um, you're based in Fiji. Um, I think just a week ago or two weeks ago, some people were stopped from doing a peaceful protest, uh, or was it uh, a march or something? So what is the possibility for ordinary people to gather for a peaceful protest to voice their opposition to any number of misgivings that uh, they might have or experience? Yeah, Sasi, uh, I think you may have seen it on Facebook because I think the video went viral. There were mm -hmm. a couple of people, um, I think in Nasese near the Pacific Regional Seminary. They the had assembled to, to gather. Uh, this was around the time of uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And there were some placards about climate change. Right. And that they wanted um, stronger outcomes from the COP26 that was sitting in meeting in Glasgow. And then they were very quickly rounded up by the police and asked to disperse. Now, you know, you would have thought climate change is, is not a political subject. It doesn't offend anybody except uh, maybe big industrialized countries. Uh, and yet they were stopped from protesting. So to answer your question, um, the chances of getting approvals to protest or demonstrate uh, in, in Fiji are probably next to zero. Which and that was a recent example. That was just two weeks ago. Two weeks which ago. Which is really which, sad. Which now brings me to media freedom. Uh, let's talk about that. Now, during my days in radio in Fiji, I ran a talkback show. And let me tell you, it was a no holds barred talkback show where I could discuss anything and everything. These days, I have carefully observed that over the years, the media have been under enormous pressure, and it seems in some quarters they are seriously gagged. Some of my media mates are even too afraid to have a normal Talanwa session on the phone. What are your views of media freedom, Graham, in Fiji these days? I think uh, you will recall a couple of years ago, the Fiji Times editor, Fred Wesley, and uh, a couple of uh, journalists in the Fiji Times, and the newspaper itself got fined $100,000. Uh, and uh, a, a couple of media people, including Netani Rika, got uh, suspended sentences. Um, so there's not a lot of media freedom. There's a lot of self-censorship. Uh, the media development decree uh, has had a chilling effect on free speech and a free media. Um, and it's it's certainly not democratic, uh, and you're absolutely right. Um, the, the media people are, are quite afraid of speaking out, uh, lest the f long arm of the law catch up with them. Graham, the term fourth estate or fourth power refers to the press and news media, both in explicit capacity of uh, advocacy and implicit ability to frame political issues. Given, in, in Fiji, given that in reality, there is no media freedom in Fiji per se, how does media in Fiji regain their confidence and independence? That's a very difficult question, Sashi. Until the, there's a change of government that recognizes the importance of free speech, uh, I don't think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the government doesn't understand that the role of the media is not to praise the government of the day. The role of the media is to hold the government accountable. Indeed. So that's a very important principle. Um, and this government, unfortunately, uh, seems to forget that. The government, the, the Fiji Times is not there to uh, praise the government, it's there to hold the government accountable. Now, Fiji's political landscape changed when the de Hunt electoral system was brought in. We now have the 2013 constitution as well as the electoral system, which have been, as I put it, imposed on the people. The biggest drawback is uh, what is termed the unfair 5% threshold rule yet the Fiji voting public have been led to believe that for a few years now that every vote should have equal value. Firstly, 
may I please request to, or ask you if you could briefly explain what is the Dijon system? Uh, the Dijon system basically is a system of proportional representation. So if you win 50% of the popular votes cast, it should translate to 50% of the seats in parliament. But sometimes it's very difficult to get those proportions exact. So you might get percentages. But in, in a nutshell, it's supposed to be, in theory, a more democratic system. But in the context of Fiji being one constituency, I don't accept the proposition that it is democratic. Um, as the constitution spells out that you need to win 5% of the votes cast to qualify for a seat in parliament. On the 2018 results, election results, that uh, came out to be about 25,000 votes. So if you win 6,000 votes, um, even as an individual candidate, as an independent, uh, you will never get elected to parliament. So the Dehan system in its uh, Fiji context, in the Fiji constitution, works uh, against small parties and works against independence. Okay, now let us look at Fiji today. What do you think are the major areas or issues of concern that is of uh, significant concern to the populace now? What are the big, big stories? What are the issues? The big issues are obviously the economy. Um, the, the economy uh, was in trouble before COVID-19 uh, started. Uh, it's worse now with uh, borrowings from the Asian Development Bank, the Exim Bank, the World Bank, um, all the other lenders. So the, the economy is, is pretty down, as you can imagine. Um, and with the economy, uh, we have um, unprecedented levels of unemployment, uh, stretching all the way in the tourism belt from Ra, Rakiraki to Singatoka, and in the outlying Yasawas and the Mamanudas. Um, a lot of people who worked in the tourism sector uh, have been without jobs for the last 18 months. Uh, so the economy has been ravaged by COVID-19. Uh, unemployment uh, is, is a major issue. I think governance is also a major issue. You know, we talked earlier about uh, the lack of local democracy, the lack of freedom of speech, uh, media censorship, uh, and so on. The other issue, I think, uh, Sashi, is um, poverty related to uh, the economy uh, being in the doldrums. You hear so many anecdotal stories of families going to bed, uh, just having had a meal of noodles and a long loaf of bread with a can of tuna. A lot of people are growing their own food now, but a lot of people in the urban areas who don't have a plot of land um, are having to live with a lot less, with uh, maybe one or two breadwinners in the family no longer working. So poverty is a major issue in this country. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Our chief guest uh, this afternoon is uh, renowned Fiji lawyer Graham Everett Leong. Now, via Facebook Live, if you have any specific questions uh, that you'd like me to put to Graham, please, uh, you could type that uh, in the comments uh, section and uh, I will try my best to run that by Graham. Now, we've just spoken about the concerns uh, that, uh, uh, you know, is so uh, prominent or, or so significant in Fiji. Uh, you've mentioned unemployment, COVID-19 issues, poverty, etc. cetera. Um, given the current areas of concern, how effectively is the government tackling these concerns? Well, as you know, we've had uh, the Fiji First Government for the last 14 years. Um, despite um, the propaganda that uh, they have brought about a boom economy, I think all the evidence would suggest uh, something to the contrary. Uh, we have greater levels of, of poverty um, in numbers that we have not seen before. Uh, we, the infrastructure um, is, is down. 
the state of the, the medical hospitals in this country um, is very poor. I wrote an article a few weeks ago about the state of the CWM hospital. Um, it, it's in a terrible condition. Uh, the staff and the doctors are very hardworking. But look, the CWM hospital was built at the end of World War I. So it's, lived, it's outlived its usefulness. And if you go there, it's quite a depressing sight, to be honest. And, and the, the joke is that it's no longer the Valle Nimbula, it's the Valle Nimate. Mate. Uh, yes, so, um, you know, it's, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad. But the state of medical uh, hospitals in this country is a, is a matter for concern. Now, let me turn my attention to the recent uh, COP26. Recently, a 36-member delegation, including the Prime Minister and the Attorney General, attended the conference of the parties, COP26 in Glasgow. Many have uh, described the Fiji delegation as being on a junket. New Zealand, for example, had a five-member delegation, yet Fiji had a 36-member delegation. I believe uh, you wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister and asked the question, do you really need to be at COP26 in Glasgow for two weeks? What concerned you most about the PM's two-week trip? Well, um, I understand the first week of the two-week conference in Glasgow, uh, in, in the first few days, um, heads of government and heads of state made high-level statements. Um, basically announcing or stating their country's national position on uh, the latest developments uh, at the COP26. And so it wasn't really necessary for the Prime Minister to be there for the entire two weeks, because in the second week, uh, typically the conference would have broken up into small working groups uh, dealing with various um, themes. Uh, you know, conferences have themes. And in the climate change context, there would have been a working group on uh, finance, on mitigation and adaptation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the prime minister wouldn't be involved necessarily in the date, in the hour by hour negotiations that are typically uh, conducted by lawyers and uh, uh, climate change specialists and diplomats. The, the heads of government and heads of state normally come in at the end if there's a declaration to be signed or if there's a committee to adopt. So um, it really wasn't necessary for the Fijian prime minister to be there for two weeks. You know, that was his decision. Uh, I, I think it was uh, an extravagant waste of time. Um, yes, be there for the first two or three days, have your bilaterals, uh, meet the British prime minister, uh, meet the UN Secretary General, deliver the national statement. Uh, there were far more pressing issues uh, back at home. So. All right. Now, given Fiji's 36-member uh, delegation, how effective do you think uh, the climate change conference was for Fiji? Well, I think it was the Attorney General himself who... Uh, said at the end of the conference he was disappointed uh, with the outcome. So obviously, if he was disappointed, it, it means that uh, the conference didn't meet the expectations he and the Fiji delegation had uh, coming out of Glasgow. So I'm not sure what the 36-member delegation achieved. Maybe they'll tell us uh, now that they're back in Suva. But there hasn't been a great deal of transparency about what they did and what they achieved. Um, and that's been typical of the government so far. They don't really tell us when anything is not working, but uh, when something uh, is apparently working, they're the first to, to claim credit for it. Let's turn our attention now to the due process of law in Fiji. Just a fortnight ago, the Solicitor General was terminated for allegations of uh, misbehavior. News reports have said that uh, Mr. Sharvada Sharma uh, is challenging his termination in court. While we cannot discuss many issues because the matter is uh, sub judice, my question to you, however, is 
whatever happened to the due process of law in Fiji? Is it not a case that a person should be given a fair and proper chance to answer to allegations brought against him or her? Well, Charvada Sharma was um, not treated fairly because when he was first suspended by the government, the government itself announced that a tribunal would be set up to look into allegations uh, of misconduct against him. And then six weeks later, before the tribunal was uh, even convened, we're told that the, the president, the outgoing president, had sacked uh, Mr. Sharma. And um, to this day, I don't think uh, any member of the public knows uh, the allegations against uh, Mr. Sharma. But apparently he was delivered a letter containing 31 allegations against him. And we know that from uh, a public statement which his lawyer, Richard Naidu, made uh, in the press a few days ago. And he was given three days to answer 31 allegations. I mean, it's just completely inhuman the way Mr. Sharma was treated. You don't treat people like that. You don't treat people uh, unfairly in the way that Mr. Sharma was treated. This is the man that gave 20 years of his life to serving the government of the day, to serving the government faithfully. Um, and then he was thrown under the bus, just like that. And apparently the letter that he was delivered was delivered on Diwali night. And I think Mr. Sharma is a Hindu. So, a devout Hindu, yes. A devout Hindu. Uh, I think if he was a Sharma, he would have come from a family of pundits. But, I mean, that aside, um, if I was Mr. Sharma, I would have been gutted. Um, you, you, you treat people with a sense of compassion and decency. And I don't think Mr. Sharma got that at all. Well said. And uh, it'll be and interesting as... Well said, as I mentioned, it will be interesting to see how this matter unfolds in a court of law. Now, Graham, you were a former president of the Fiji Law Society. Under today's so-called Fiji democracy, where does the legal fraternity stand? Well, in the past, membership of the Law Society was compulsory. The laws have now been changed so that membership of the Law Society is no longer compulsory. So the majority of lawyers in this country do not belong to the Law Society. So that has been an obvious change. And so in many respects, the Law Society has been weakened deliberately. It no longer represents the majority uh, of the profession. I think uh, there are as little as 300 members of the Law Society in a profession which has now about a thousand lawyers. So that's been a deliberate ploy of the authorities and by the authorities to weaken the voice of the legal profession. Um, the, the Law Society has been doing its best to stand up for the rule of law and democracy, uh, but I think uh, the majority of lawyers are not comfortable supporting the rule of law publicly. They fear retribution. They fear revenge. They fear being singled out by uh, the tax man or the police or uh, FICAC, which is the anti-corruption agency of government. Uh, I don't think the law society uh, is as strong as it used to be. Uh, that's because um, it's been weakened by law. Thank you. Now, let's have a little chat about uh, your assessment of the 2022 forthcoming elections. Now, Fiji heads to the polls next year. From uh, afar, from where I sit, it seems that the smaller parties are fragmented. And in some quarters, such as Sodelpa, there is a division from within, which has been happening in the past few weeks. What is your assessment of the 2022 elections? Well, they say a week is a long time in politics. Uh, if there's going to be an early election, I think we might have it as early as July or as late as November next year, uh, Sassy. Uh, but I, I think, the, the, as you rightly 
point out, the fragmentation of the opposition parties is unfortunate uh, because it is weakening the opposition, at, uh, weakening its chances of winning government. Um, so the governing party must be very happy looking across the, uh, the political divide and, and seeing the, the scraps and the internecine rivalry and backstabbing that's uh, carrying on largely, as you pointed out, in uh, the Sadelpa opposition party. It, it's hugely fragmented, um, and it wouldn't surprise me if the Fiji First Party came back with a resound tree. But it's interesting to see what kind of impact Sitiveni Rambuka's uh, People's Alliance Party will have um, on the overall political scene. Now, do you think, uh, this is a question from left field, <laughs> Um, do you think uh, there should be a grand coalition of parties uh, that could uh, that should be formed, and that could truly challenge the status quo? Well, I'm not a politician, Sashi. Uh, it'll be for the opposition parties themselves to try and work something out. But I think the initial attempts to try and gather support. Uh, for the uh, opposition parties to collaborate has not met with a great deal of success to date. Um, it's very difficult uh, for, for egos, very difficult for people to give up their territory and to say we're going to subsume our political identity to the identity of a bigger party. So um, we'll see. You know, there, there could be surprises coming down the track. Um, it's November. We've still got a few months uh, before the general elections. And I think behind the scenes, there's still a lot of movement and a lot of talk of, of trying to um, strengthen the opposition parties um, so that they can try and win government. Thank you. Now, I have a question from uh, Dr. Anil Kumar on Facebook. And his question is, Mr. Leong, what are the prevailing risk factors and the likelihood of another coup d'etat being executed in Fiji, Vinaka? I can't look. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for that good question. I'm not able to look into the um, the tea leaves, or and I'm not a clairvoyant, uh, but it, I think that question is best directed to the army commander. Uh, you know, all the coups we've had in Fiji, uh, in, in one way or another, the army has been involved. Whether well, it's 87, uh, with 2000, there were elements of the CRW um, that were involved in George Spate's coup. You'll remember that, the CRW. And then in 2006, there was the Baini Marama coup. Uh, now we have a new commander of, of the uh, military. Um, so it remains to be seen what the position of the army would be in the event that the Fiji First Party were to lose at the polls. Uh, but I hope uh, and pray that the Constitution is respected and that the will of the people, freely expressed in the ballot boxes, will be also respected. Time I think, Yes, I think we maybe, Sasi, we have reached a level of, I would hope to think that we would like to think we've reached a level of political maturity um, where coups are a thing of the past, uh, but um, only time will tell. Graham, in uh, closing, just a few more questions. We've spoken about the general sense of hopelessness amongst the population in Fiji. What can the people, what can the people do to make that turn around and regain a sense of purpose in their lives? I, I think we, we need a government that listens. We need a government that uh, thinks of the people. We need a government that is compassionate. We need a government um, for the people. Um, you know, the worst kept secret in this country is that two people run the government. We might have a cabinet, we might have a parliament, but essentially two people run the country. And uh, because they've been there for so long, they've developed tin ears. They don't listen to anyone. Uh, 
Um, and if you disagree with um, the Attorney General or the Prime Minister, you're victimized. Um, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's democratic. All right, and finally, Graham, I'll let you answer that. Finally, um, any chance we see you standing up uh, in the elections next year, putting yourself as a candidate? Well, the thought has crossed my mind, Sasi, but um, I don't think what it I have what it takes to be a politician. Um, uh, the, the jury is still out on that question. Um, I've got my private interests. Um, I wish to go farming in Kandavu, where I have a house. Um, I think it's a it's a far more peaceful atmosphere. Um, you know, fishing in Kandavu. Uh, is a lot more attractive to me uh, than sitting in Parliament making long speeches uh, that nobody listens to. Uh, so I think that's the uh, the best answer I can give. Who who knows what will happen six months down the track? Well said, very well said. Now, Graham Everett Leong, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking your precious time on this Sunday to be part of the inaugural. Sashi Singh's Talking Point program. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Your assessment of things uh, in today's Fiji has been a real eye-opener. And uh, just before I ask you for any concluding remarks, I would, uh, like to you, uh, I would like to wish you in advance a very happy birthday for next Friday. Thank you very much, Sashi. Uh, you've done your homework. Um, <laughs> yes, one year older. I'm not sure one year wiser. Yeah, you asked, uh, you suggested I might have some closing observations. Yes. Just that, um, you know, Fiji is at a crossroads. We've had the government for the last 14 years. Uh, I think when governments are there too long, uh, they they tend to tear. They, they tend to lose steam and, and maybe take more for granted. And change is always healthy. Change is beneficial. So I, I'm hoping for a change of government. Uh, I'm hoping that we have a new set of leaders that can take the country forward. We're at a crossroads in terms of the economy, in, in terms of the morale of this country. Uh, so there are many reasons why a change is desirable. So um, at the end of the day, it's the people of Fiji, Sashi, that will make those decisions. So before you exercise your vote in the next general election, think about what you want for your children and for this country um, and go to the polls in large numbers. And I, we have a free and fair poll uh, next year. So I'm sure we're all praying for that outcome, Sasi. Graham, once again, thank you so very much. Vinava Lebu um wonderfully delivered. And... Uh, Thank I you, Sasi. Uh, the pleasure has I, been mine. Thank you, and I hope uh, perhaps down the track, uh, if this program continues one day soon, we will have another chat on, on Fiji, its politics, its policies, etc. Thank you very much, Sasi. The pleasure has been mine. Thank you. Bye -bye. God bless, and have a, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You, cheers. You are watching Sashi Singh's uh, Talking Point, and uh, shortly we will uh, join uh, our uh, two regular contributors. Uh, Dennis, uh, it's time for you to come on in. Uh, if you can enter the studio, we will be in business, my friend. Very soon we'll uh, meet up with uh, Dennis Rounds and Nick Hiltzing.
Nikhil Singh, if you're uh, watching or listening, please enter the studio. While we're waiting for uh, Dennis uh, to uh, join us, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Nick Hilsing. Nick Hilsing is a former Fiji television journalist. Since 2004, he has been active in the Australian labor movement and has been a senior trade union official for the past 15 years. Nickel is a strong advocate for advancing workers' rights in Australia and the Pacific and with those words, it's my pleasure to welcome Nikhil Singh to Sashi Singh's Talking Point as a regular contributor. Nikhil, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Sashi. It's a pleasure to be with you. All right. Uh, I uh, welcome you indeed. Uh, uh, I think we might just have to drop your volume a little bit. There's a little bit of uh, echo, but we can fix that up very, very quickly. Um, now, Vince, there's a message here. He says, every time I accept, uh, it just terminates, so perhaps you'll need to send a new one. All right, uh, Nikhil, um, welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point, uh, one of our regular contributors uh, from Sydney. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Now, um, what's uh, um, been making the news? Uh, I believe one thing is the landmark Fair Work Commission for uh, horticultural workers. There's recently been a landmark ruling by the Fair Work Commission in relation to these workers. Take us through the significance of this. Can you hear us? All right. Uh, what's happening? <laughs> Sashi, I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can, just give me the thumbs up and I'll just continue. I can hear you now. All right. So as I, as I said, uh, give us a heads up about the significance of the Fair Work Commission in relation to uh, horticultural workers. Oh, all right. We seem, we seem to be having a problem. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? I hope so. Um, now, Nicole, can you hear me? I think I can hear you now. All right. Well, we've seen hundreds of horticultural or farm workers from the Pacific Islands, including Fiji, come over to work in Australia under the Australian government's seasonal worker program. Firstly, what is this program about? Well, Sashi, the Seasonal Worker Program was established under the Australian Government's Pacific Australia Labour Mobil Mobility Policy. Um, and really, there are two main objectives for, uh, for this program. Uh, number one being to assist employers in the agriculture and accommodation industries uh, to fill the gaps unable to be met by the Australian workforce. So we've experienced a lot of labour shortage um, in those in industries, in, um, including the agriculture, the farm worker um, space. Um, and the second objective set up under the policy is to contribute to the economic uh, development uh, of the nine participating Pacific Island countries, including Fiji. Now, what is the implication of the Fair Work Commission's ruling? So earlier this month, um, uh, to be precise, on the 3rd of November, the Fair Work Commission ruled in favour of an application uh, by the Australian Workers' Union, ensuring that farm workers would be entitled to the casual minimum hourly rate of $25.41. That was the ruling um, that was delivered on the 3rd of November. And uh, what in main is the difference uh, to the previous uh, arrangements for these workers? 
So the method methodology to calculate or pay wages um, in the agriculture space in this, uh, for these farm workers has predominantly been based on what's called piece rates. So if you take a fruit picker, for example, the individual would be, would be paid according to the quantity of the produce picked. You could say um, $100 for a ton of grapes, for example. And we have seen the problems associated with this system uh, where workers have been paid as little as $10 an hour, uh, and in, in some cases, even less, um, if you equate that on average on what somebody gets um, over a period of a week. Um, so you can imagine $5 an hour, uh, if you're gonna collect, say, you know, five tons of grape to get that $100, that is back-breaking back -breaking work. Um, the other huge issue that we have seen in Sashi, um, in your day, um, John, as a, as a solicitor, um, the issue of worker exploitation. That has also been highlighted in this industry. And I think um, whilst it not may address fully the, uh, this very, very uh, um, huge problem, uh, it will go a long way in terms of um, addressing um, the uh, issue of worker exploitation to uh, to, to a degree. Uh, so the Fair Work, in its ruling, said the peace rates system is not fit for purpose and that the hourly minimum wage of $25.41 applies to these farm workers and that is a significant change. Thumbs up. Thumbs up to the Fair Work Commission. Um, the, obviously, exploitation has to be eradicated. Now, let's uh, go to COP26 uh, quickly. Um, COP26 uh, has come and gone. Um, where does Australia stand in this? Uh, obviously, COP26 uh, conference was held in uh, Sydney. And um, let's unpack what it means for Australia. Um, Sachi, the COP26 um, conference held in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I think we find ourselves in a very bizarre situation. Um, and I say that because we're trying to figure out if Australia is trying to have a bob each way. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Firstly, there was a strong reluctance initially by Prime Minister Morrison to attend the conference. Um, eventually, he did, kicking and screaming, as, as some uh, would say. If I take you back to the Paris Agreement, known as the Paris Agreement 2015, uh, I make reference to that because this was rather a, a, a very significant conference where all participating countries um, for the first time agreed to work together uh, to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees and aim for 1.5 degrees. And COP26 um, this year was seen by many climate change experts um, as a make it or break it conference where countries would review the 2015 commitments and address the gaps. Uh, the sad thing that has been highlighted in COP26 is that none of the countries have even come close to achieving what was set out in 2015. Now, Australia took a plan to COP26 to work towards net zero emissions by 2050, but it was only that, a plan. It is not legislated, so there really is no obligation on the Scott Morrison government. Um, now, in contrast, the federal Labor opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, has promised to legislate the 2050 goal. The other problem that Morrison is having to deal with um, is some noise that is being uh, made in, domestic, in Australia in itself, with, uh, with, in fact, uh, by his own team members. Australia was a signatory to a joint request for countries to re-examine and strengthen what's called the midterm commitments or goals, which is the 2030 targets, when countries return to the next conference, um, which will be known as COP27 in Egypt next year. Uh, but Morrison's deputy, Barnaby Joyce, who's also the nationals leader, has gone on national TV and said that they haven't signed anything. In fact, his words um, uh, were, the nationals did not sign anything, I did not sign um, anything. So you can imagine the um, the conflict uh, that, that arises out of just that, that statement. So the Prime Minister of Australia is saying one thing, the Deputy Prime Minister is saying another, and, and bizarre when you consider they're in the same team. So I'd like to say that uh, if you ask me where do we stand, I think um, we are clear as mud on where Australia stands.
All right. Well, just before we leave uh, the COP26, uh, India seems to have pulled a rabbit out of the hat, so to say, at the very last minute in, 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 in a play of words. They certainly did, Sashi. This is quite interesting. Um, much to the dis- disappointment of, um, I think, the entire conference and particularly the conference chair, Alok Sharma, who got quite upset um, after days of negotiations as the countries finally put their stamp of approval on the conference communique, um, which, amongst other commitments, highlighted the phasing out of coal. India somewhat vetoed the communique and imposed the words phasing out to change to phasing down. So before the conference chair could drop the gavel, um, India, India dropped the word out. Um, and the other interesting point of that was China, which uh, otherwise shares a tense relationship with its neighbor, was a very strong ally throughout the final negotiations. All right, now upon returning from Glasgow, uh, Australian Prime Minister uh, almost immediately headed to Melbourne where he started visiting factories, having a haircut in the presence of uh, a media pack, and just being out there, being seen. Now, this has been his first visit to Melbourne in six months or so due to COVID. What can we make out of this? Is this just a normal visit, or is there more to it? What do you think? Well, Sashi, it does uh, beg the question, doesn't it? Um, The federal election can be held on or any time before the 21st of May next year. Uh, Now, Morrison clearly hasn't been having a good run, both uh, domestically and internationally. Um, His trip to COP26 was uh, overshadowed by the very public spat uh, with France because of the fallout from the Australia and France submarine deal. Uh, The French president did not hold back and went to the extent of calling Morrison a liar. Uh, domestically, as I mentioned before, he is somewhat being under, um, undermined by his deputy uh, and national leader, Barnaby Joyce. Uh, and then the federal opposition um, has accused the prime minister of lying uh, to the Australian public, Australian people, um, on, on a number of issues, including electric vehicles, the COVID vaccine rollout, um, and the establishment of the federal ICAC, or the Independent Commission Against Corruption, um, so, battered and bruised, uh, I believe, uh, Scott Morrison hit the road to try and repair some of the damage. Uh, but what is interesting is that he chose Melbourne, where he hadn't set uh, foot for six months. Now, for the Morrison government to be re-elected, they cannot afford to lose any of the marginal seats they currently hold in Melbourne. So, when you start seeing a prime minister in high vis visiting factories, strolling down the street with a candidate or a local member or having a haircut in front of a media pack, one can only draw a conclusion that he and his government are certainly in what many would say a phantom um, election campaign mode. Let me tell you something. Um, That phantom mode, uh, no, well, when you see a prime minister picking babies and start kissing babies, that's when you know that election has kicked in. And uh, now talking about elections, uh, New South Wales, of course, is heading towards local government elections. Uh, any uh, update on that? Any, any, any comments on that? Uh, um, a, a quick one is just, I think, uh, some um, important dates. So, yes, the local government elections in New South Wales will be held on Saturday the 4th of December. Um, you might know that uh, uh, already know that these elections have been deferred or were deferred, were supposed to be held in October, but due to the COVID restrictions, um, this will now be held on the 4th of December. Um, pre-polling, however, will start tomorrow. So um, from tomorrow, we can say the uh, local government elections are on. All right. Now, uh, I believe a federal member of uh, parliament, uh, uh, a lady member of parliament, has uh, made a remarkable achievement. Yes, Sashi. So um, celebrating the achievement of women in politics, I think uh, this one is my pick. Uh, Tanya Plibersek uh, is the Labour Federal Member of Parliament for Sydney. Um, and she goes under the hi- in the uh, history books because she now has become Australia's longest serving female Member of Parliament, marking her 23rd year 
in the House of Representatives. Wonderful. And uh, any word about uh, what's uh, made uh, the news a few days ago about uh, former federal Labour MP uh, Craig Thompson? Well, I think Craig Thompson is in the news again for the wrong reasons. Now, the meta, the current meta now is before the court, so I will only report that uh, uh, police have charged Craig Thompson over his involvement in an alleged multi-million dollar visa migration fraud. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out in court, Sashi. Wonderful. Well, uh, Nikhil, uh, any closing remarks? Um, I'll look forward to um, the the next program and to bring to our viewers uh, the happenings uh, that uh, occur from now until the next program. Nikhil, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you on uh, the first episode of uh, Sashi Singh's Talking Point. I really, really look forward to our collaboration in the weeks to come. Have a very pleasant day. We'll catch up with you very soon. Thank you, Sashi. And uh, we've got uh, Dennis Rounds. Uh, give us uh, uh, about two, three seconds. We'll have Mr. Rounds on the screen. It's now my pleasure to welcome uh, our second regular contributor to SSTP. Dennis Rounds was a former journalist and communications specialist with the U.S. Embassy and public affairs officer with the Australian High Commission in Fiji. He was co-owner of uh, Ireland's uh, business magazine before retiring to Lotoka, currently a regular columnist with Ireland's business magazine, a former work colleague of mine uh, from uh, Fiji Broadcasting Days. It's a pleasure uh, to welcome Dennis to the team. Hello, good afternoon. And uh, welcome, Dennis. Welcome to the first episode of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Sashi. Um, uh, and I must apologize for not being able to sort of connect earlier. But uh, now that we're on, thanks a lot. No need to apologize. The, the beauty is we've got you back on. I was uh, starting to panic a bit. Uh, look, it's, it's, a, it's a personal delight for me that uh, you could join me. As I said right at the very start in the introduction, Sashi Singh's talking point developed in the deep crevices of my mind about four years ago. And uh, it just hibernated there. And a few weeks ago, when I called you um, and I ran this by you, I was delighted that I got the, the thumbs up from you. So let's uh, have a discussion about uh, what's happening around uh, your town, about uh, your country, Fiji. I believe that a few political parties, uh, let's start this one off. A few political parties have threatened to take uh, the supervisor of elections, uh, Mohammed Sanim, to court. What can you tell us about this development? Yes, uh, that, that case I think is still pending. They haven't filed yet. I, I, don't, I haven't seen any uh, uh, mention of that happening as of yet. But uh, they have threatened to take uh, Sanim to court. And it's uh, after they've accused him of uh, bringing, bringing disrepute to his office by making what they say are controversial decisions. So it should be interesting to see uh, what, what will happen. Uh, they've also referred to a recent uh, Court of Disputed Returns ruling, which declared uh, Mr. Sinem's removal of uh, opposition parliamentarian uh, Nico Nawaikula as wrongful and unlawful. Um, Mr. Nabekula, if you hadn't heard, had apparently used a name different from uh, that on his registered birth certificate. And that was, according to Sinem, against the, uh, the, the procedures. Um, so at this stage, uh, we're still awaiting parties to actually carry out their threat of uh, taking him to court. Uh, but in the meantime, since they've uh, made that announcement. Uh, we've also had over, heard overnight the uh, resignation from the Electoral Commission of uh, Suresh Chandra, uh, who was chairman. Uh, now there's some interesting um, issues behind his resignation. Um, parties had already called for, had also called for his resignation. 
and they seem to be bits and pieces coming out as to uh, why he resigned. But that really needs to be um, seen and expanded on in the coming days. Okay. Now, uh, talking about the supervisor of elections, uh, as in the recent past, a few of the court matters where he has featured, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the last two or three court matters, uh, uh, he's lost uh, all of those matters. There have been rulings in court against the supervisor of elections. Would I be correct in that? Yes, I think there's been four cases uh, so far against uh, that, that have gone against him. Um, and that's sort of what's being used by opposition parties to sort of call for his uh, resignation or his removal. Um, again, I think Graham Liang alluded to uh, the situation in Fiji where things are not as, as normal as they should be. Uh, one would expect that uh, he may stand down in the interim while investigations are continuing uh, into the allegations against him, but uh, that doesn't seem to be happening at all. We'll keep uh, watching, we'll keep a watch out, and uh, we'll see what uh, progress, uh, or the, the news, how it progresses. Now, the Sodelpa party was once supposedly united and the major opposition. However, in recent times, we've seen that uh, it seems to be imploding, and since uh, Siti Veni Rambuka has left, his charm seems to be increasing with his new uh, alliance party. What is the reason for the implosion in uh, Sodelpa, and what about the charm of Rambuka? There's been a lot of infighting for Moe back for, for a number of years now, uh, and sort of growing factionalism within the party. Um, Rambuka's resignation from the party, uh, and uh, Bill Ngaboka's ascendancy to you know the leadership, together with uh, Nangama. Uh, what appears to be happening is, within the party itself, there seems to be a faction that wants to back Rambuka, but remain in the party at the same time. Uh, so, you know, I think Ngavokas described them as sort of rogue elements within the party. But I, what I think needs to be seen is the impact that Rambuka's departure from Sudelpa will have, uh, given the formation of his new party and um, the fact that he has growing support, evidence through uh, public polls in the newspapers. So it's going to be an interesting election uh, next year, because if Rambuka does take votes, he's going to take votes from Sudelpa, nowhere else. Now, that, well, I, I believe that his votes would come from Sudelpa supporters rather than from Fiji First. So what we could have in the next election is a split of the Sudelpa votes, giving Rabuka a chance. That weakens Sudelpa's uh, position in Parliament, um, but it also strengthens the Fiji First position. Because any split in votes is not going to get a majority in Parliament. No, not at all. Um, the small parties, as you know, have been talking uh, about forming a coalition. Uh, but then again, that's also been an issue of contention, given that uh, Savanada Narumbe, who's the uh, leader of the uh, of uh, his own sort of party that he started just recently, he started he has started these talks with coalition partners, smaller parties, to try and get them unified to fight the election, but he's also come out publicly to, to sort of uh, not so much complain, but to decry the fact that parties don't seem to be interested in, in sort of uniting against Fiji first. Uh, so Delpa and NFP were two, uh, two parties in particular that weren't, were not part of uh, the coalition efforts. So, you know, it, it's interesting what's happening here in Fiji. And the more the smaller parties we have, the greater the split in votes and the likelihood that one party being the FFP, which is still united under Benimarama, will continue to lead. All right, let's uh, change uh, tack for a little bit. 
I understand that some government decisions uh, are now being challenged in court. Uh, uh, you're aware of this. Do you have any examples of this? Well, I, I think uh, Graham Liang alluded to the, to the fact that the Solicitor General is now contesting his own case in court. Mm -hmm. And then you have this situation where the parties are, are taking the supervisor of elections to court. So for the first time since 2006, we seem to have a movement of, re of uh, people contesting government decisions. Um, and it's only just a, a recent event, not something that we've seen in the years since 2006. And I must say it's a welcome sign. And I, Ebert, uh, Graham would have told you the same thing, that basically the questions are now being asked of government and of government decisions, basically because not enough consultations have been held and procedures have not been followed. Well, that uh, again is something uh, that is in the pipeline. Uh, reason of dissent uh, coming to the forefront is, is, is a positive sign that uh, some people in some quarters are ready to uh, take the stand. Now, I believe uh, teachers in Fiji have uh, been featuring in the news a lot uh, this week as they've been told uh, that there are threats that they might lose their jobs. Uh, what is this uh, situation re in regards to? Well, it, it relates basically to uh, the need for teachers to upskill they, themselves. Um, the Minister for Education, Pramila Kumar, and her sec permanent secretary have said time and again that teachers, while some of them are practicing, have not really attained the qualifications required for the positions they hold. And this has been turned into a political football with the opposition parties complaining about how the message has come across from Premier Kumar and from Jokan, the permanent secretary, uh, Angela, Angela Jokan, that is, uh, as if they were totally against teachers. Um, I, I, I think there's been some sort of misrepresentation by political parties as to what the situation is. Um, I, Jokan and uh, Premier Lukoma are correct in uh, the sense that teachers do need to upskill, but it's the manner in which they've put that message across, which is, uh, as Graham Liang said, a bit sort of arrogant or in your face. Mm -hmm. That uh, is going to be an interesting uh, story to follow up as well as to uh, whether there's going to be a strike in Fiji after a long, long time, who knows, uh, in terms of a teacher's strike. I, I, I doubt if that's going to happen, uh, Sashi, seriously. As Graham again said, uh, we require permits for demonstrations, for meetings, and it's almost impossible to obtain yes. a, a permit from the police. Now, Fiji has a new president. Uh, pray do tell, who is he? He's the Tui Madawata, Ratu Williame. Um, Ratu William Katunivere. Uh, he's a former president of the Fiji First Party. Uh, he's known to be uh, an advocate for environmentalism and for uh, sustainable fisheries. Okay. Now, Fiji was uh, recently mentioned uh, in, in a recently published corruption report. Where does Fiji stand in terms of this particular report? Well, I think Fiji in that report has fared well compared to some of the other Pacific countries, but the fact of the matter remains that corruption, the perception of corruption is pretty high in Fiji, uh, especially so amongst uh, government and business officials. And the allegations of uh, sex being uh, used, uh, you know, in a corrupt way, has, has, has come to the fore here in Fiji. So it doesn't all go well for, for Fiji. Uh, there's obviously going to be um, rebuttals of the report from government. But uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, 
the perception of corruption in Fiji is pretty, pretty stiff right now. Uh, people don't feel too comfortable with a lot of the things that are happening, as oh, as mm -hmm. Graham Liang had also referred to. Well, Graham also earlier referred to uh, the the state of the economy partially due to the COVID uh, that uh, uh, was rampant well right throughout the universe. So after a lapse of a year, flights have now started uh, getting into Fiji. Tourism for Fiji looks uh, on the up and up, uh, with uh, bookings mostly out of Australia. I, th I believe I read somewhere that uh, there could be 40 or 50,000 people traveling to Fiji. What's the tourism vibe like in Fiji right now? Uh, I think the tourism industry is ready uh, to receive visitors. Uh, at the moment, uh, the forecast is for 30,000 visitors in uh, December and a further uh, 40,000 in January of uh, 2022. Um, it should be interesting to see what happens uh, given the COVID restrictions that we have. Uh, the visitors to Fiji need to be vaccinated, uh, but they still need to undertake a, uh, a test, a, a quick test. Uh, 24, I think it's 24 or 48 hours after arrival in Fiji. So that will be an interesting uh, thing to watch out for because it's not clear who pays for it, whether the visitors themselves pay for it or whether they get that test done free. <laughs> Anything that happens uh, uh, to do with visitors, I'm sure the visitors will have to pay for it. Now, you're not talking about that same thing where tourists have to pay three hundred and fifty dollars uh, fee for a COVID test before their departure or is that a separate thing no that's a separate thing so before boarding a plane you need to have a, uh, a COVID uh, test uh, and it should be ne uh, negative and that has to be 72 hours before you actually board the plane but what i'm talking about is in addition to that so those who are coming from australia will have to come with a certificate sure which is within the 70, 72 hours. But on arrival in Fiji, they will have to then again, after 24 hours, undergo another quick test just to, just to make sure that they, that they are not uh, COVID positive or have COVID symptoms. And then before they leave, they have to have uh, uh, another test and uh, that's the one they're going to charge uh, in Nandi, $350 for that COVID test. Not that I know of, no. It's those right. of us in Fiji who are de it's those of us in Fiji who are departing the country mm -hmm. who need to undergo that test. And the, the cost varies in Suva it's three hundred dollars in Nandi I think it's three hundred and sixty dollars, but I think you can also get it at government hospitals at a cheaper rate. All right, wonderful. Now, uh, Dennis, uh, any any other items or matters you have on on your plate for us this Sunday? Uh. Not really at this stage. There's nothing much uh, happening in Fiji right now. Um, I think as we start to gear up towards the 22, uh, 22 elections, we start to have a lot of uh, things happening, a lot of uh, accusations flying this way and that way. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, uh, things people are simply looking forward to the opening of borders so that the economy can uh, get a kickstart and you know people can get back to work. Well, Dennis, uh, look, uh, I am absolutely delighted to have you on the uh, SSTP program as a contributor. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your efforts uh, today. Uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. As I said, uh, you were on the top of my list. I look forward to your regular contribution to this program in the weeks ahead. And uh, the beauty of it is uh, Fiji heads for elections in 2022. And uh, knowing the political landscape of Fiji, There'll be lots of uh, interesting tidbits coming out of there. I look forward to it, to just as uh, you are looking forward to it. And I think the whole of Fiji is looking forward to uh, 2022. And the question is, of course, who comes in, who comes out the winner? Uh, that obviously will determine the future of this country. All right, my friend, Dennis, thank you very much. God bless you and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. I know one of your sons having his birthday. Enjoy the family celebrations. Thanks, Ashi. Cheers. Cheers, mate.
We'll catch up this afternoon later. I'll phone you. Right. Will do. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, 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 that is our first show for today. I would like to thank our chief guest, uh, Mr. Graham Everett Leong, and our regular contributors, Dennis Rounds from uh, Fiji, and uh, Nikhil Singh here in Sydney, for being part of this inaugural episode one. I take this opportunity in thanking all our viewers for your participation in the program. If the power that wills, God willing, we shall be back uh, for episode two of Sashi Singh's Talking Point next Sunday at 12 noon Sydney time. I'd like to thank uh, our technical producer, young uh, Vince at home, for uh, doing all the setup and the technical aspects of it. And I have a very, very big thank you to uh, a brother here in Sydney, Dave Chopra, if you're watching. Thank you very much uh, for doing the posters last week. It received a good number of uh, hits. Uh, great uh, work there, Dave, and I really appreciate your assistance. Folks, stay well, stay safe, stay blessed, everyone. From Sydney, Australia, this is Sashimendra Singh bidding you farewell, namaste, and ni samode.